I'm really delighted um, to have Reese Jones out here with us. Reese uh, is has a very very interesting background. Has been a prolific inventor, founder, CEO, board member, trustee, and um, for those. How many of you out here, if raise your hand, know what a twisted pair is for networking? No. Okay, some of you. I think we can age discriminate out here. Um, well, he's the father of twisted pair. Oh. And uh, and also was uh, the inventor uh, and um, of sound standards for internet, which then led to voice over IP and other standards uh, for digitized sound over the internet. He founded. He has founded among several companies, I won't name them all, Farallon, which was the networking company for those of you who remember Twisted Pair, Netopia, which had to do with uh, sound, uh, Cambrian uh, Genomics, which is actually in a very different uh, business. He was a biophysicist when he started his university training. I'm going to let, you, let him speak to all of this because it, there's a real thread of doing a whole host of interesting things besides, of course, then leading companies as CEO, He's also a board member at both the Santa Fe Institute. For those of you who haven't heard of Santa Fe, it's another very interesting institute that does all sorts of both research and educational initiatives. And at Singularity University, which is based right here at NASA Ames. What was nice is besides this great and checkered uh, sort of innovation inventiveness is that Ketan and I had the pleasure of meeting Reese um, at Burning Man last year uh, in, in, in our tent, and that's how we got to know him, and then since then we've, we've met him as well. So he's a burner uh, in addition to being all of this. So please uh, join me in welcoming Reese to Edmodo. Hi, all. Uh, enjoying your lunch. The, um, uh, I thought I'd go through a, a, a bunch of slides of old days of hardware and software uh, to give you a flavor of how uh, my learning of things has evolved. And it might prompt some uh, questions and discussion about that. Um, but my uh, um, academic background was in biophysics and I was planning to uh, be in academic medicine doing brain research on what's wrong in schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorders. And so I was 10 years at Berkeley and, and then doing research at Lawrence Berkeley Labs on, on brain chemistry. And I, that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, and at the time, uh, that was great fun and, and I could see spending a life doing it. Uh, but I also had a hobby, and my hobby was phone hacking. And phone hacking led me into all kinds of adventures that I'll explain about. But this is a, a pad image of, of a person in various states of thinking, including being dead, where nothing is happening. And so one of the uh, um, uh, new frontiers, uh, that's interesting to me still is inner space uh, in the same way as people are researching outer space. So the, these pictures are made by putting a bunch of cameras around somebody's head and in injecting a, uh, a chemical that has uh, an atom that uh, when it decays, it, it puts out uh, a positron, which is the opposite of electron. And when it finds an electron, they make beams of more or less light that the cameras pick up and from uh, a billion pictures, you can reconstruct a picture of what's happening inside the head or body or whatever. Um, pet images were, uh, and the machines that make them, were something I worked on in the early days. And 
As you can see, there's a lot of cameras that are attached to computers, that are attached to wires, in a fairly high density. And so I was actually dealing with some of the problems of how do you make these, how do you actually build these things? Uh, and so I got involved in, in the wires of them at the time. And, and, and this is where a person goes in the middle of that hole. Um, So as the slides come back, uh, things are getting faster. Okay. So th this is a PET scan. This is a, uh, a CAT scan, which is kind of the same thing. The person goes in the hole, and this one you shine x-rays through them and make the picture and the whole machine spins around to make the picture. Um, this is a fMRI, which the person goes in the hole again. And this one is a big magnet. Um, and all of the, these gadgets around the edge are uh, radio antennas that you can ping the, uh, um, uh, the protons, basically, or carbons in the person and, and and make pictures with the reflections. Okay. So what uh, was uh, interesting, so fMRI has evolved quite a bit in that you can now uh, ping the, the, uh, the atoms at one location, they'll flow into another location, and you can make uh, maps, for example, of, of how uh, the blood is flowing in the brain, or how the nerves are connected together, or the connectome, or this is becoming a, a, uh, a major thing. And so the project that I was trying to work on was a certain part of the chemistry in people where in schizophrenia it's working at a different pace than in normal people, and the goal was to figure out why. And so in, in the images, it was actually making images of the uh, carbon of uh, that turns things on and off like genes and membranes and so forth and how that's different uh, in a normal person from a schizophrenic person um, and how that uh, is part of how we think and how our brain works. So it's a very complicated network, the brain, the biochemistry is even more complicated and so a lot of this was actually network theory and, and how do you uh, deconvolve what is the what is the reaction that's different in the um, normal person from another, comparing different techniques um, with different chemicals. And so there's a lot of detail to this, but on the whole, uh, I was making uh, a different version of carbon that, that we normally have in biochemistry, which is carbon-12. And if you make carbon-14, most people have heard of, it's radioactive a little bit, for a long time and you can measure the different chemical forms that you metabolize. And you can also make carbon-13, which you can measure magnetically in a magnetic resonance, um, and make carbon-11, uh, which is radioactive with a positron, and so you can make uh, pictures of where that carbon is with carbon-11, carbon-13, carbon-14, and carbon-12, which is the chemistry. And so to make carbon-11, you need a big machine about the size of this building that uh, uh, accelerates particles, it's called a cyclotron, and you um, hit basically a nitrogen with a proton beam, and some of them turn into carbon-11, which only has a half-life of 20 minutes, so you start out with that, you have to quickly synthesize it into the uh, molecule that you want to inject in the person, purify it and so forth, but this is a, a building at Berkeley that uh, is a cyclotron that the um, um, entire thing was run on a Commodore PET computer, um, which was sort of the practical uh, state of the art at the time. Um, 
and then the uh, for some of the people, if the, these techniques would work, where you could not necessarily uh, be focused on schizophrenia, but it, for example, brain tumors, uh, where the metabolism of a brain tumor is is faster than the normal brain, and then as it's growing, it's using sugar. So you can make a picture of where the brain tumor is with with PET. You can make a, an image of where the brain tumor is with MRI. You can get an accurate sense of where the edges are with CAT scan. You can do all these things together and find out, oh, exactly where a brain tumor is, where it's growing, and so forth. Uh, and then you can use these machines to, to actually burn it out without opening the person's uh, head um, where the beam is, is set right in. So this is an even bigger cyclotron also at Berkeley, the um, 184, that uh, can be used to burn out um, tumors. So you put the person's head in a plastic mold um, and find out where the, the tumor is um, and that if you uh, put them in the, in the line of the beam that maybe is coming from the coffee machine, uh, you have to spin them around in all directions with the tumor in the center and the beam burns out the tuner, tumor but doesn't really burn their skin. Um, so, so I was involved in these kind of experiments and research and big science where a cyclotron costs hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and to treat a patient it, it was so expensive that it's not practical to do for real people or real medicine. Um, another accelerator is the one called SLAC at Stanford, which is uh, um, where I ran into what was the Homebrew Computer Club, and which had occasionally these meetings at SLAC. And so this is the auditorium there that uh, uh, the Homebrew Computer Club was uh, um, something that about half the people were actually interested in phone hacking more than than building computers. This is where the Apple I came from. Um, and it, it was just a, a hobbyist kind of maker-hacker gang that uh, gathered on a, on a regular basis um, in, in a setting like this. And, and people just shared, like, well, what's new and cool um, in their world? And this led to uh, um, uh, the phone hacking equipment that were necessary, which the worldwide phone network is sort of the most complicated thing humans have ever built. And the, what was curious about it is if you made a sound at, at the right frequency at the right time, you could get the whole system to go into maintenance mode and make calls anywhere you wanted for free. Um, and so the, uh, um, the phone company figured that out after a while and, and they said, well, you have to make two tones to do that. And so. The obvious thing was to make a box and to make two tones, and then three, and then four, and then that's hacking as of today. But th this is, for example, uh, um, Jobs and Wozniak with the Apple One. There's Wozniak with a dorm in Berkeley with a blue box, um, and the uh, um, various characters. Uh, in Berkeley, there was there's a place called Top Dog that uh, has two phone, or used to have two phone booths out in front, and the one of the hobby tasks was to start at one phone booth and call New York, then London, then Moscow, then Tokyo, then call all the way around the world and ring the phone booth next door. So you could hear yourself go all around the world. Um, and so you had to figure out the tones that each country used um, to do this. Um, then uh, the Macintosh um, was introduced and, and we started a, a group at Berkeley uh, called the Berkeley Macintosh Users Group, BMUG. And this became a, a big and popular thing. We would have weekly meetings on the Berkeley campus in one of the largest lecture halls and talk about, well, how could you hack the machine? Like put a hard drive in it, because they didn't at first, and, uh, and what could you use it for, and, and the software. And the, the group as a whole was very savvy about the computer, uh, and the software, and so the companies would come and demo their stuff, and most uh, um, frequently, the somebody in the audience would know how to make their app crash the whole system. And so they would say, well, what happens when you do this or that? And the, it would crash in front of the audience. 
of 500 people or so. So we got, what happened is the companies would send their best people, so the, the CEO and CTO of most of the major companies would come and present because when it crashed, they wanted to be able to, you know, explain why. Um, so BMUG ended up uh, with uh, sort of do-it-yourself hacker maker kind of ethos. And around that same time, Apple didn't put um, Ethernet in the computer, even though they could have. Um, and Ethernet at, at that time was actually designed by Bob Metcalf at, at uh, Xerox Park to run on coaxial or triaxial cable. So uh, a bit like a garden hose in size and a big clamp that of, of heavy hardware that was the fashion of the time to attach the computers to the wires. And it was also designed as a bus to run in a straight line because um, that team were computer engineers, they thought about computer buses, they thought about putting it outside the computer and so forth. And, uh, and so for me, I, I wanted to build a network um, and I wasn't trained in engineering um, and so I didn't know it was impossible to use phone wires. Um, and because that was the engineering dogma of the time. Um, and so, but I was familiar with phone hacking, so I used phone parts to build computer networks um, to hook the computers together using um, phone wires. And this started out with the kind you have at home and evolved over a period of years into the blue wires that you commonly see today. Um, uh, which is Ethernet modified to run over phone wires. And, and so phone wires um, also carry uh, sound. And so early on, um, beyond hooking the computers together, the interest, well, how do you get the sound into the computer? And then how do you uh, send the sound over the network? And how do you store the sound and for music and voice and so forth? And this became MP1 and the predecessor to Skype in the early days of how sound works, including editing it and other cool um, features where sound being a data type in the computer. And of course, video is just sound with pictures. So we, we built uh, first Verilon, which was, and then Natopia, which was, were companies that uh, help first hook all the computers together, then the floors together, then the buildings together, then the cities together, and for both data and voice, and, uh, and, and these were the early plumbing of the, of the internet, um, focused on phone companies, or how phone companies give you the internet. Yeah. Somebody jumped it, it, it. These are cool special effects. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you process sound in the computer, you can use AI to listen to it. It says, does that make sense to make that sound? And if it doesn't, you don't think it. <laughs> um, so the, the first company was, was Natopia that was how do phone companies give the internet? Uh, and then we did a, uh, new, another company um, called Secor that uh, it became Aris, which is how cable companies give you internet. And the reason they were two separate companies um, is because the buyers went to two different trade shows and it made sense to just do it differently, even though the technology was very similar. And now recently, um, uh, these have been merged together into Aris, which does boxes the odds are you have in your house or in this building that hook you to the internet um, uh, whether it's coming from the phone company or the cable company uh, and uh, google owns seven percent of that comcast owns seven percent of that and the rest of it is, is public but it's basically internet plumbing um, and then uh, that works so well first for phone companies then cable companies we, this is a, a project where we lost a billion dollars um, saying, well, let's just deliver the internet on the phone, on the electrical grid, 
Um, and so we built this whole system that uh, uh, sends the internet over the power wires and everywhere that there's a light bulb or an electrical plug, you can plug in a little thing like that and, uh, and you have high speed internet along with electricity. And this is, I, I, I think, the future of everywhere that there's internet, there should be power. Everywhere that there's power, there should be internet. They're, they're sort of the same indivisible thing. Uh, however, something surprised us that uh, uh, power utilities, they don't want to give you service. They don't want to give you internet. They don't want to talk to customers. They don't even call people customers. They call them rate payers that are something in a spreadsheet. And so even though they could provide internet for free with your lights, um, they didn't want to do that. They like the the technology and the software and stuff, and they use it to monitor their power grids now, but they don't let you have access to the internet that's going over the power grid. Um, and then at the edge uh, of, of these wires are people, and people move, um, and so people should be wireless, fully attached. And this is sort of an exponential chart, and for those who aren't familiar with these exponential graphs, uh, with your exponential on one side, uh, over 100 years, the, the, the speed that you can send things wirelessly is getting about twice as good every year. And it has been for 100 years. Like when the Titanic sank, um, the best they had was Morse code, which was pretty slow. And now they could do 4K video of it going under. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> So this exponential improvement in, in uh, performance of technology is, uh, is happening that people mostly are familiar with Moore's Law, which is a law about how many transistors you can fit on a silicon wafer um, improving every year. And that has the functional um, notion of computers getting more or less twice as good every year, two years, same thing with phones and so forth. But there's a lot of things that follow this exponential path, um, not just wireless, not just transistors. And it's been happening for 100 years, and not just about tra silicon transistors, that this was happening with vacuum tubes and punch cards, and that the performance and cost performance of things is on this accelerating or exponential pace. And so um, we started, a uh, university that the, the concept kind of spun out of head and a, a book by Ray Kurzweil called The Singularity is Near in a structure uh, kind of like the International Space University and this happens on the NASA campus here in Mountain View uh, and it's um, teaching people about technologies that change fast and applying them to problems so that your solution to the problem if you're using exponential technologies gets twice as good every year, even if you don't do anything special, if your design makes use of a technology that's getting better. So if you want to address, say, education using phones, your solution will get twice as good every year, even if you really don't change it, because the phones are getting twice as good and the wireless network's getting twice as good and so forth. So teaching people to think about these things from a different framework is what the purpose of, of Singularity was, and then it's uh, um, a learn by doing um, type of teaching approach like Montessori school, um, which, um, and it happens on the NASA campus. So it's, it's basically Montessori space camp for grown-ups um, along that model. Um, <laughs> well, and, and so other things go at an exponential pace in, in uh, for example, biology, um, the population here of, of, say, humans on the Earth is uh, growing at an exponential case. But uh, in biology, few things stay exponential forever. You run out of land, you run out of food, you run out of resources, and they actually flatten out, and that's called an S-curve. So it may appear to be exponential at first, but it's not. 
And so biology is, is actually, an, has some elements of an information system that can grow at an exponential pace. And so just as you can pr program computers in ones and zeros and then with high level languages to make the ones and zeros, in biology the code is DNA and you can program uh, living cells in DNA in the same way you can program computers in bits. And you can actually move between any of these modes. So read the DNA, uh, write the DNA, uh, edit it, and so forth. So you can, for example, take a cell, read its code into the computer, change it, write it back into DNA, put it back in the cell, and the cell will have new software. Um, and you can do experiments uh, improving what it does. Um, so this actually uh, is on a faster uh, pace than Moore's Law where the, this is, for example, is a graph of, of uh, reading DNA, um, which is getting um, uh, cheaper, faster, five times uh, the pace of Moore's Law. So the ability to read a genome, uh, edit it, and to write it um, is getting better at a, at a pace much faster than we experience with, with computers, phones, and software. And so the process is basically um, starting with a living thing, uh, reading the DNA, uh, editing it, getting your new software back in the creature that's like a picture of, of yeast, uh, that in yeast make beer, and so you could program the beer to have an extra app. Um, so like a group at Stanford and another group at Berkeley, for example, took the genes from opium poppies and modified them and put them in yeast. Um, so you can grow, brew beer that also is making opium uh, while the yeast are <laughs> fermented. So there's all kinds of creative things that you can think of to do. So, so another uh, is there, there's a lubricant called squalene that's used uh, in, in cosmetics. Uh, and for the main source of that actually is from livers from sharks. And so people are killing sharks to get this little bit of oil that they use for cosmetics. Um, and you don't need, once you have a synthetic biology, you can actually take that same DNA uh, and put it in the beer yeast that will make that, that cosmetic oil that will float to the top of the beer and there you have it without any sharks involved. Uh, and so in the homebrew club, um, like the new homebrew club is brewing software in yeast that you can do at home in your garage. And you can, and yeast is kind of like iPhone and bacteria is kind of like Android. And so you can develop apps that run on these different platforms that you can do at home uh, and, and make what you want, basically. Um, and so these things are complex, and I got involved in the complexity theory of it, which has sort of led me to help out with Santa Fe Institute, which is a, kind of a research think tank that also does online courses on uh, complexity theory. Uh, similar in the med school at Harvard, there's a, a genetics uh, research council that sort of oversees what are the, the research directions that are happening there. But if you look at, say, a tree of life and the different genetics of life, it looks a little bit like a computer network. Um, and so from a biophysics point of view, they're kind of similar in that way. And th some of the most outstanding things in programming biology is building living things out of parts. So in 2010, at the top there, is the first living self-replicating, full-on alive creature that was built completely out of parts. Uh, there's no parents. The parents were computers uh, and software. And so um, that has a, uh, uh, about a thousand genes. Um, and then just this year, in the last month, they started taking out genes to see which ones were important. And, and the most recent is uh, this bacteria that uh, has 473 genes. And if you take any one of them out, it dies. But, uh, so that's like the minimum viable life form. Um, and that you can, 
it will reproduce, and then you can add your app in it. So it's uh, kind of developing the new platform. So life is, is complicated, and part of that complexity yields free will. And from my own casual observance is the more complex an organism is, the more it appears to have free will. And so if you're developing for a bacteria and you put in your code, it'll most likely run it. If it's more complicated like a yeast, um, it'll run it on a sunny day and if it's cloudy, it won't. Um, and so it has a little element of free will. And then in humans and plants and things, it's more, much more complicated and your program is much less likely to, to run properly. Um, and, and so here's a biological digital interface um, where the, uh, the digital part is interacting with the biology part. And, and biology is, is more complicated and less predictable, so it has more free will. And so it, occasionally things happen that, that you don't uh, plan for. <laughs> And, and a, another trend that's kind of fashionable right now is, is, uh, is VR and AR. And many of you have probably seen the Apple um, Macintosh introduction where uh, a woman with a sledgehammer comes running down the aisle and the, all the cult of people are sitting watching a big screen. Um, and this kind of reminds me of that. Uh, and so like an extension to VR is, well, not just your eyes, your ears should be covered and should have haptic feedback on your body and your hands should be censored. And so like the trajectory of the VR helmet is very much like this. Um, and from a, uh, a user point of view, if you um, watch people using VR, isn't that good? So VR is cool, but think about that. <laughs> uh, so this is like a picture of Mechanical Turk from uh, like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, where you basically use humans as components in a machine to do something. And in a sense, you're, you're basically putting a person in a gadget. And the internet has a billion people in it. And so if you're using the internet to do something, you're actually using people for, to some extent. Uh, and then this is like drones and robots um, that are also the same kind of thing where that you're programming the, the machine to behave a bit more like a person, whether it's on the ground or flying, uh, coming soon. Um, and so the, the, all these things are sort of exponential technologies into uh, change. And this is not STEM in the education uh, sense. This is space, time, energy, and matter. And these are all interrelated in a uh, physics way, uh, related to black holes, um, which are thought to be the, the uh, tractor that holds uh, galaxies together. And there are singularities on um, Earth that are a change from something predictable into something unpredictable. So this is Lake Berryessa, not far from here. And so when you, if you were swimming along and you fell in that hole, what would happen to you is unpredictable. And some people like to play with these things. Like this is another singularity point where people are right next to the edge of it. Uh, and the, the water is flowing in kind of a normal way. And then it goes across a, uh, an edge, an event horizon, into an unpredictable scenario. And so it's, uh, uh, you can be close to uh, an event horizon and not fall into it. But once you do fall into it, it's, it's quite unpredictable. So here's somebody um, uh, going over uh, an, an edge like that uh, in a kayak boat. And he uh, goes over the event horizon into the singularity point of uh, uh, the water uh, and the, uh, 
what happens to them isn't algorithmically predictable or mathematically predictable um, that you don't know is is he dead is he hit the rocks is he stuck under the water um, and so the same thing if your um, technology is changing fast what is changing into like when the internet becomes smarter than people what's going to happen isn't so predictable so in, in this case he survives that particular uh, event uh, not so happy but uh, alive um, and then here he's going to try it again and another uh, going over the event horizon into a singularity point and what happens to him you don't know but you, you've heard about the white light of death perhaps um, so the, these, these singularities just pretty much mean unpredictable and the most popular one is, is the Big Bang, which it may be that our Big Bang was a black hole for somebody else, and what we see as black holes are big, ho are big bangs for somebody else. And this is another way to think about what are singularities. Um, I'll sort of gloss over this, but um, another use of these exponential paths is like where and, and how did life start? Uh, on this planet or somewhere else. And if you plot just the complexity of life on an exponential graph, you can see that um, single cells, pro prokaryotes are like a bacteria, eukaryotes are a cell inside a cell, and then plants and animals and so forth. If you plot those as a complexity going over time, and then just draw a line through it, the line goes back nearly 10 billion years. And the uh, Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So by this analysis, almost certainly life couldn't have started on this planet. There hasn't been enough time. And the major components of life, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, couldn't have formed in this solar system because they're too heavy. And so odds are fairly strong by this analysis that the components of life and, and maybe uh, the basic uh, living things started somewhere else and arrived here. Um, by uh, uh, um, asteroid or, or comet. Um, and then uh, what is consciousness, or what's the difference between life and not life? Uh, and there's a, a guy at, at MIT named Max Tegmark who has kind of a theory that uh, consciousness in life is, uh, is another state of matter where um, the difference between me and a, a dead me right here is uh, the matter's the same, the chemicals are the same, everything's the same, but I just drop down uh, in an energy state, um, just like going from gas to, to liquid, um, that is losing consciousness and then losing life. And so the medical definitions of consciousness and life are like, am I arousable, am I responsive? Like if I, somebody cuts me open for surgery, do I yell out or am I you know, uh, anesthetized? Um, do I have comprehension about what's going on? And then a definition of, of consciousness includes, do I have friends um, and a community and so forth? And so just being conscious but disconnected isn't sufficient. And I'll sort of wind up with a, a project that just started this um, uh, month at, in San Francisco, which is uh, exploring the inner space of uh, uh, psychotherapy using psychedelics to uh, treat um, intractable things like um, a PTSD or, or a suicidal depression and those are kind of hacking the brain using tools that are very it's a complicated system with complicated tools um, that uh, is showing great promise um, and then there's sort of this dematerialization that is happening where the old school way of things happening is disappearing. And with the example, say, of, of Uber, it's, it's kind of a taxi company that owns no taxis. And Facebook is kind of a media company that creates no media. And this is happening in a lot of parts of, of uh, society and, and technology. And so it's a, a way to think about how to avoid being disrupted. So I'll, I'll stop there. This is a map 
of, uh, of the routers on the internet and, and that their activity over a 24 hour period. And so this animation is how busy your quiet routers are um, on most of the internet. And where it's red and yellow is where the sun is shining. People are busy doing their work and the routers near them are busy. And where it's blue is in the nighttime where the routers are relatively quiet but you see occasional yellow and, and red spots in the, in the blue part. And those are like the Google data center synchronizing or, or uh, things of that nature, uh, backups. But in a sense, this is the internet being awake and, and dreaming. Um, and the dreams are reconciling the data from the day before and the awake part is creating new data. And it's a bit like the brain. So uh, I'll end with that and uh, ask if there's any questions. Yes. Use the microphone. Oh, where? Right in front of you. Oh, there. Flip it on. Give it a second. Is it all the way on? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Hello. So you mentioning about like kind of being able to read from cells and write to cells. So uh, the question is, suppose you actually like, came up with like, a program that you really like want to inject in the shell, but it's like you have an actual like, living organism, like let's say a rat. How do you go about like, replacing the entire programming in all the cells of that rat? Well, so the, many people may have heard of something called CRISPR, or CRISPR-Cas9, which is a, uh, like scissors and tape for editing DNA. And so, you, it's a um, biochemistry that came from the immune systems of bacteria, that how they recognize a infection, cut it apart, and, and save the, the memory. But the uh, um, way that you get the, so you write your program as a gene, and then you use the gene sequence to make your CRISPR inserter to go to the right place in the gene of that rat, and the tricky part in a mammal is how do you get the gene that you've edited into all of the relevant cells in the mammal. And actually next weekend at MIT is the Mammalian Synthetic Biology Conference number three, uh, where they talk about exactly this, um, in that the, the several ways to do it, but there's one uh, that comes from nature, which is using bacteriophages which is a, a little creature that infects bacteria, it looks like a, a spider space pod, and the legs know where, what cells to grab onto, and the interior then injects what's in the capsule into the cell, uh, and that's your code if you remake that delivery vehicle with your code in it. And that's one way. Another is nanoparticles, and there's, uh, in plants there's a kind of practical thing called a gene gun where you make little BBs that have your program in the BBs and you shoot them into the uh, plant and you hope that some of your code lands in the right place. And then you see which ones run. Kind of like a virus approach. Exactly. So the first one is a bacteriophage, which is, is a virus, a fancy kind of virus that, that uh, can be used for that. This is really fascinating. You mentioned uh, making a living, I think, bacterium with only 473 genes. Is that is that it? And you said if you even take away one, then it actually goes from living to not, not living. It, does that mean there's a minimum genome, or is that still being so? In the sense of the size of genes has to be a minimum size for it to be a living creature versus not. Yeah. So this was just published last month by uh, Craig Venter and and his team at JCVI, and they've actually been researching that for 20 years. So they. The first uh, minimum bootable cell was 2010 published, and that was about a million base pairs and a, a slightly less than a thousand genes. And since then, they've been taking out ones to see which ones are, are essential. And so of that 473, um, they've made um, variations that have 472. Uh, by taking out every one of those. And so their current publication is that every single one of those 473 is essential for reproducing life. 
And if you take out even one, any one, it stops. Um, and so that's like the first publication just a month ago, really, um, about that. But that's kind of a two big breakthroughs there is, well, how do you make living things out of parts without um, creation? <laughs> Uh, and, um, and that was first done in 2010, and then this year, 2016, is they figured out what's the minimum number of parts for it to boot and, and live. So, my understanding is that CRISPR is actually being used today by hackers in their garages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you describe like what some of the things people are doing are? Well, so if it, um, so the Chinese did a project uh, uh, where they had a, a bunch of fertilized human embryos that were known to have a genetic defect and they made a CRISPR that went in and cut out that genetic defect uh, and spliced it back together. And their first public, so last year, um, nature and science people agreed not to do this, but they did it anyway. And, and their result was uh, uh, about a third of them were viable they didn't Im implant any of them, um, but the the current ethics is don't modify the human genome in a way that it can be inherited. Um, but in plants and animals and bacteria, it's kind of fair game. Does that answer your question? Well, I mean, like someone in, so someone with a garage know, a few blocks from here is doing something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, probably not on human embryos, but um, but for example, you can take the the genes that make fireflies glow, uh, copy those, you don't even have to copy them, the database is on the internet. Uh, you can synthesize that, those genes, or even order them through FedEx, uh, and use CRISPR to insert them into a plant. Uh, and then that plant will glow in the dark uh, use it by running those genes while it's normally grown. And, and the price of a CRISPR, I heard, is, a, is like a couple thousand dollars. Well, it's, it's DNA. You have lots of DNA in you for free. Uh, it's like getting the right piece. By the machine, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, no, no, no. CRISPR, like CRISPR is just DNA. Oh, okay. it, um, yeah, it's proteins and DNA. Yeah. So it's almost... It, the tricky part is getting it made right accurately and purified. Other questions? <laughs>